everyone, and welcome to today's Meet the Artist event. I'm John Beardsley, an author, curator, educator, longtime resident of Rappahannock County, and all-around fan of the visual arts, and I'll be your host. This is the second in a series of six monthly virtual exhibitions hosted by RAC, the Rappahannock Association for the Arts and the Community. Uh, the series presents work by county artists in two-dimensional and three-dimensional galleries online. And the, these exhibitions give you an opportunity to, to see the artist's work. Uh, these Meet the Artist events give you a chance to hear them talk about what motivates and inspires them, and also insights into how they work. Before we start, I'd ask all of you uh, to keep your microphones muted to re reduce background noise. Uh, and uh, if you like, set your, uh, set, set your camera to speaker view. In the interest of time, uh, we'll, we have uh, six artists to interview uh, today, and uh, in the interest of time, we'll dive right in. First artist up is Patricia Underwood, who obtained her Bachelor of Fine Arts from Miami, Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and her MFA in printmaking from Washington University in St. Louis. She's a printmaker and mixed media artist who uses unique combinations of materials and her own language of symbols. Her bodies of work encompass human struggle, spirituality, and healing. She has exhibited nationally and internationally at venues including the Corcoran Gallery of Art, the McLean Project for the Arts, uh, and she had two solo shows in Warsaw in 2007. Her work is included in numerous private collections, the Artist's Book Collection of the National Museum for Women in the Arts, and several other institutional and corporate collections. Her latest body of work, uh, which is featured in our June exhibition, Virtual Exhibitions, is scheduled for a solo show at the Athenaeum in Alexandria in 2021. She depicts ancient trees that she's photographed around the world. Uh, showing their collective way of existing for millennia and what they might teach us about surviving in the unfolding climate crisis. She's taught drawing, printmaking, visual foundations, and color theory at several schools, including the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. And her home studio is located in Castleton, Virginia, and she's uh, represented by Haley Fine Arts in Sperryville, Virginia. Patricia, our first question might be, how do you select your subjects? How do you decide uh, what to paint? Um, hi, John. Thank you hey. for being with us tonight and moderating this. Um, I've always worked in series. So, um, you know, and I typically, I was trained classically and I had to draw and paint, but that grew into do, always working in, a, in series. And so, um, the series typically have to do with some social or, or uh, cultural issue of great import to me. Um, some of the things in the past have included um, body image. So for instance, I did Bembos and Goddesses, which compared ancient and modern images of women. Um, Healing Shields dealt with a lot of cultural um, things like racism and homophobia. Um, and most recently, Rancor and Discord had to do with um, uh, the disintegration of civil discourse, especially since the 2016 election. But the most recent body of work is this taking territory that uh, has to do with, with trees. So I, I, I hone in on, on a social issue or a, a cultural issue, and then I start to explore it. <clears throat> or in this instance, uh, an environmental issue, is that what drew you to the image of trees? Absolutely. Trees uh, started with climate change. I started to read a lot about climate change several years ago. And um, I suddenly realized that there was a stack of books that I had read based on trees. And so that started to be a focus. Um, and, 
And how, how are these works made? They're described as photo screen prints and mixed media. Um, do you start with a photographic print and then paint over it? Yes, in this instance, um, and, and materials are always really important to me. And a lot of, and most of the time, they really do guide what the whole series and the pieces are going to look like. Uh, in this case, um, I tr tripped upon a stack of wood veneers uh, in the trash, actually, from uh, actually a gentleman out here in Rappahannock, Steve Morris, and he has a veneer company. And I fell in love with them, and so I started painting and printing on them. And in th this series behind me, I basically started with a the photo of the tree, um, went to Lily Press in um, Rockville to have them help me blow it up, and it was screen printed on. So it started out um, just a blown up version of a photograph uh, on on wood, but you know, no paint. Um, so it, it you know it it got depicted onto the wood, and then slowly I started to embellish it with colored pencil, um, uh, paint markers, uh, and then eventually the lino cuts, the shape, the, the symbolic shapes are actually printed um, with lino cuts. And how important is it that the works are actually on wood panels? Um, <clears throat> well, as I just discovered wood veneer about seven, eight years ago. I fell in love with it as a material, so it kind of replaced paper or canvas. And then as I read about the trees, um, I felt really good about using this scrap wood and, and you know, using it up um, as an environment. You know, it, it's starting to be much more concerned in my own studio with um, how I use materials and how they relate to, you know, the earth. <clears throat> What is it um, that you hope the viewer will take away after seeing your work? I mean, and what's the relationship you strive for between your work and the viewer? Um, well, I hope, first of all, that they actually just enjoy, you know, the, the layers, the images, et cetera, uh, the physical presence of the piece. I hope they, you know, they get something out of that. Um, but more than that, I hope they come away like with a curiosity, perhaps, to know a little bit more about, you know, what, what the piece is about. Um, in this particular series, these are, I consider them like narrative portraits of these ancient trees. And they've got um, what I would call like um, magical realism. So there's a there's a depiction of a tree. In this case, the one you're showing, it was a, um, a, a red, one of the redwoods in uh, Armstrong uh, Redwood Reserve, north of Bodega Bay in California. It had already been felled, I mean, it, naturally, but then the forestry came and had cut it. So the root ball was showing. But so, you know, I, I, I kind of anthropomorphize them. They're, they're like these ancient beings that are trying to tell a story. And hmm. that's what I'm hoping, um, if people take the time or at least wonder what, what the heck are these symbols all about, <laughs> um, that's what I hope, you know, that that will lead them into kind of learning a little bit more about what, you know, what the piece is trying to say. <clears throat> and, and where does the language of, of symbols come from, the abstract images that you combine with the <clears throat> representation um, image? Yeah, so in, under, in undergraduate school, I was very classically, I mean, I, I drew from the figure in the landscape, and uh, my last year in undergrad, I needed extra hours, and I took Japanese, and that kind of, I, I was very impacted by how this whole set of symbols, um, to my eye, that looked really like little designs, actually meant something. So in graduate school, I ended up um, kind of creating my own set of marks based on music that I would listen to. And I have notebooks full of these and I, they've just appeared in my um, work for years now. Um, sometimes they're just, well, the works are just symbolic, but in this case, I'm kind of using the symbols like the piece you're showing. It's a stump and the symbols below the stump are kind of like the stored knowledge. And mm -hmm. the, the, the symbols escaping from the, the top of the stump are kind of like some of the knowledge that the stump is trying to admit, you know, into the world. Um, anyway, I, I hope that gives you an idea. Yes, it does. That's great. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Patricia. That was terrific. There's lots to, to think about in your work, um, the, especially in the relationship yeah. between the representational image and the, the more symbolic language of form. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. Next up is Adam Disbro, uh, and he's here with Cheryl Cruz, who's the art director for the Sperryville Artist Cooperative and the founder of Living Sky Foundation, an educational nonprofit organization uh, that provides music and art enrichment in Rappahannock County, Virginia. Cheryl, please tell us a little bit about the Sperryville Artist Cooperative. Hi, thank you for having us. Thank um, you, welcome. Yes, well, we established the Sperryville Artist Cooperative in the spring of 2013. Uh, we were at that time attached to the River District Arts, and so we took on um, the community outreach uh, to build and strengthen art participation in that arena. Uh, we primarily showcase self-taught, emerging, independent artists, as well as talented youth and offer uh, youth programming as well. Um, it, we are an artist-operated gallery, and uh, we support both traditional and non-traditional artists, um, which we also include experimental, innovative, and urban art that stretches the boundary of what is often considered traditional, judged, or status quo in the art industry. So we're still sitting um, atop of the Sperryville's River District in a rustic yet inviting showroom. And we have an enticing collection of multi-dimensional artwork, paintings, mixed media, photography, and art of social commentary. Well, thank you for telling us a bit about the Artist Cooperative. Uh, Adam Disbro is a founding member of the cooperative and is the featured artist in this month's exhibition from the Sperryville Artist Cooperative. Uh, Adam graduated from the University of Virginia and is recognized as a prolific creator of poetry and visual art. His work combines abstract expressionism, European expressionism, and neo-expressionism in a style he refers to as major expressionism. He has a focus on layers of objective conceptuality and pulls upon both history and culture in his paintings. Adam, uh, Tell us a little bit about your titles. Um, their, title, their works in this selection called Nothing, Something, Anything, and Everything. Um, does that give us a clue to, to uh, what motivates your painting? Yes. Um, I suppose the title would be something that would give the viewer a port of entry to the piece. Um, I'm a very verbal person, very linguistic. Um, I studied English and I've studied art history quite a bit. Um, so I use language really specifically in my work. Um, before I dive into deeply, I just want to say thank you so much, Patricia. Your work is beautiful. And um, I'm really, I found that fascinating to hear you talk about it. Um, thank you so much. Um, the titles specifically for this series that you mentioned, Everything, Anything, Something, and Nothing, those four pieces really evolved. Their accumulation of the past, I suppose you could say five years in 2014, I really started, um, I really dove into expressing myself visually. I had really explored a lot of other different avenues of artistic expression. And it was early in 2014 when I um, really began exploring painting my own way. And I have a number of different artistic influences that helped me do that. Um, but these four pieces really represent the accumulation of the, of the past five years. Because after I finished this series, I really went back into a phase of, um, of study and, and doing a, just a different approach. So these four works, everything, anything, something, nothing, started with the concept of everything all the time. And that was kind of the working title for all of them at one point. 
my process involves kind of like a four step thing. You know, there's these four levels of creation, I feel like, and it starts with these unmined resources that exist inside everyone. Um, these unmined creative resources that inside us all where they, they just kind of floated around and they're not really being used and they're just all there. And then you can pull that out and, and create this idea with them. There you go with, you kind of start with anything and then you can go into something and then eventually it's finished and, and passes on and becomes nothing. So the title, everything, anything, something, nothing, and these four paintings represent those four levels of creation. Um, and I work them specifically in that way. Hmm. I'm intrigued by the fact that you're both a poet and a visual artist and that text appears in these paintings. Mm. Are the text, are the words, the letters, another abstract element or are they, um, are they uh, meant to be sort of poetic inscriptions with a meaning of their own? They are very, very specifically, uh, the, the words, I will tell you, are Shakespeare. And they are pulled directly from his plays and his poetry uh, with the vowels removed most usually. Um, so, and I usually remember which play or which poem uh, the words are pulled from. So I hope that answers your question. I, I pull from Shakespeare, I pull from uh, Dante, I pull from uh, classics. And then when I do commission work, depending upon where or what the concept is that I'm working, I may broaden my horizons there to specifically whatever it is that the, uh, the person who has hired me to do the commission uh, prefers. But uh, personally, I like the classics. I love Shakespeare. Um, and I love Dante, so. so and um, the m media is quite interesting. Uh, the, you use acrylic, oil stick, and, and gold leaf. Yeah. Um, so there's a, uh, there's a wonderful combination of everything there, too, in terms of the materials. Yeah, and, I've, and in this piece specifically, you can see I've used a lot of graphite. I believe this is, yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's, I've used graphite and um, charcoal for the deeper, darker parts. Um, so, yeah, I, I really like to explore three, uh, um, heavy, heavy texture. So, um, recently, more recently, I'm working on, with new substrates, like I'm, I'm, gessoing my own linen and stretching it myself, um, not processing it totally so that you really get a raw feeling to it, specifically with the Convergence 102 piece and this um, Conflict Resolution 6. Those are linen that I've processed on my own, so they're, when, if you can see them, they're really a bit more raw and rough, so you get texture from the beginning. But then I just pile it on. So the oil stick I just love because it has a kind of a, it, it, after it dries and cures, it really dies down and you get this kind of flat sheen, but it also just, it piles up in this three dimensional way. And then I use all these different, um, I, you know, the acrylics that I use, I use heavy body acrylics very specifically. And I have all these different media that I can mix those with to get the texture the sheen that I, that I desire, um, you know, I, I use all types of different techniques to do that. Um, I like, you know, I get semi-gloss, I get this really beautiful stuff that I mix with the, um, with the, with the grounds as you would, um, to get this stuff that looks kind of like stucco. And then I also use, uh, I have glazing that I do to kind of wash and then, you know, um, so I really like to play with both sheen and texture so that when you look at a piece, that's part of the art, the varying sheen. If you, if you kind of go to the side, you can see mm -hmm. it's varied across. Uh, they're not all the, it's not just like this uniformity. It's not, it's not uniform in any way. You get different parts that pop in different ways. Great. Finally, um, how has being a member of the Sperryville Artist Cooperative um, benefited you as an emerging artist? Oh, well. 
Daryl's fantastic. I mean, I, in 2014, I was like just exploding creatively and I didn't, you know, and, and, and as an, I, you know, I, I've only, let's see, it's, it's 2020. So I've been professionally showing my work for six years. I consider that to be still emerging. Um, so with every success and with every close after a show ends, you really are just starting from the beginning again. Um, so every time you have a big show and every time you make some form of headway after it's over, you're back to where you were before you ever did anything is my experience. And Cheryl has just believed in my work since the beginning before. I mean, I, I was, I, I, I was like given a golden ticket and I was shown in uh, like the number one contemporary art gallery in San Diego for like, and, rep and had representation there for a number of years, just out of the blue, just explosively. It was really, really intense and just a, a wild ride. But I, sh I was showing with Cheryl before that even have given me a really solid home base as an emerging artist where even though I have achieved something here and maybe, you know, had some level of success, you know, internationally or nationwide, once the show is over and once the piece is sold, I can always go back to that Spirit of Lawrence Cooperative and have that as my home base and say, hey, you know what, we have this. And, and honestly, I've done better in Sparable than I have anywhere else in the world. Um, so wonderful. Cheryl's fantastic, and I can only say it's been great. Great, wonderful. Well, we're glad to have you around. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for, for sharing insights into your work. Oh, of course. Thank you. Next up is Hans Gerhard. Uh, Hans, unfortunately, isn't able to be with us tonight. So we'll just have a look at his work while I read a little bit about what he does. Hans grew up in Germany and came to the United States in 1958. And he's lived in Rappahannock County since 1987. He's studied at the Corcoran School of Art in Washington but drew most of his inspiration from his artist friends and learned from visits to their studios, uh, to museums and to galleries. Welding found objects and scrap metal has been his most recent fascination. I might add that, um, that Hans works in a tradition of welded metal sculpture that is well over a century old now. It's a tradition that uh, began with artists known as the constructivists in Russia and Germany around the First World War. But it really flowered in this country in the work of abstract expressionists, sculptors like David Smith and later Mark de Suvero, um, who uh, used found metal, sometimes farm implements, uh, sometimes scrap metal from foundries, and welded them together in, in uh, abstract sculptures. And it, uh, these Constructivist sculptors really changed the character of sculpture. Prior to this, um, uh, sculpture had been something with a surface and a volume. Think about a figure, for example. Um, whereas the constructivist sculptors and, and, uh, and subsequent artists who worked with welded metal really opened up sculpture just to be a form in space uh, without a surface and a volume, but instead um, a collection of, of uh, uh, forms that um, could be seen in multiple different perspectives from different views. So um, what's, I think, the, the uh, aspect of this sculptural tradition that Hans is really drawing on is the, um, is the uh, way it sometimes uses recycled materials. And these materials have a history of their own which is often visible in the, um, in the sort of rusty character of the metal or the, the sort of history of use that um, the metal can show. So um, there's a, a fascinating uh, material history here, a, a kind of story in the material itself and uh, uh, that, that comes across because of the uh, recycled metal. So we'll just look a little bit more at his work.
and I'm sure I didn't do as much justice to it as Hans could have had he been able to be with us, but due to technical difficulties, uh, he wasn't able to join us. All right, next up is uh, Roosevelt Goodman Everard. Uh, she's a Dutch American multimedia artist, uh, a former international lawyer who practiced in Paris and has studied art since the early 80s in the Netherlands and in South Africa. She holds a uh, certificate in drawing and painting from the Corcoran College of Art and Design in Washington, DC. Her work tends toward the surreal and the symbolic. For the last seven years, she's concentrated on trees. Her latest body of work is more abstract, but still uses trees as a point of departure. She's participated in several public art projects, including Faces of the Fallen at the Women's Memorial, Art of Note at the Kennedy Center, Courage Unmasked at the Katzen Center at the American University in Washington, and in the One House Project at the Touchstone Gallery in Washington, DC. Roosevelt says her work, whether it's abstract or figurative or somewhere in between, often starts with a tree shape. Since 2016, she's concentrated on making pieces that take her on a creative hike without too much concern, other than that the pieces much make, must make her happily surprised. So, um, and, and I assume that you want us to be happily surprised as well, right, Roosevelt? Roosevelt, you might be muted. I am now unmuted, officially. Um, yeah, I hope the viewers will be happily surprised as well. Um, for me, it was a question of escaping this horrible, as, as, as I heard it described, uh, breakdown of, of civil discourse in this country. And uh, there I felt that I needed something to, to distract me, to put me in the, the famous artistic flow that makes you um, forget everything around you. The, um, your work is sort of paradoxical in the sense that it's, uh, it, it's naturalistic as a point of departure. That is, it uses trees uh, and it, the image of trees and the image of water, for example. But it's so unrealistic. Um, the, the colors, the oddness of the images, the humor, I mean, in some ways, it reminds me of the work done by the Chicago imagists, the so-called Harry Who in Chicago, people like um, Jim Nott and Gladys Nilsson. Um, is, that, um, is, is that a sort of tradition that resonates with you? Um, well, let me put it this way. It actually is... It starts quite realistic because if you look at this, it is really a tree strip bare of twigs and leaves um, seen from seen from below. So you see the, the you see the the branches stick out and you see the um, the the tree rings. Um, and what I intend what I try to do, I don't have any intention when I start. I, um, I go on, a, you know that expression, a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. And, and that's what I do. I, I start with my tree shape, which is pretty much everywhere. And then whatever, wherever the wind blows me, is what happens. And as you may see, it's, it's very strongly influenced by mark making, um, which I love. It's very, it's very soothing. So when I hear certain voices on TV, um, then I say, no, 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 I have to make marks. Uh, my mother used to do uh, crossword puzzles and cross stitch. So she had that same drive that I seem to have to escape the world a little bit and dive into a fantasy world. Mm -hmm. um, 
the, um, the work at the same time um, is, uh, can be visually perplexing. For example, this painting it used to be the Rio Grande. Um, it's a, it combines the tree image and the water image, and um, it's perplexing. I mean, what's, what's going on here? Well, I discovered that when you do this basic tree shape, the shape of a tree with lopped off limbs, um, and you start playing around with this, and, and, and another tree will appear in the middle of it, as you can see. Uh, and then I often discover that that is really not a tree, that's a river, mm -hmm. you see? <laughs> and, <laughs> and you can just hop from one image to another and then it becomes a tree again. And uh, so it's, it's, you can approach it from multiple um, angles, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, and I like to, I like to take those, 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 those angles that then present themselves all of a sudden. Uh, I like to take those angles sometimes to extremes. And, um, or I want to do something totally different, like here with avalanche. Um, I just threw the, threw the trees down, down the mountainside. There they are. In a heap. Uh huh. Um, a lot of your work is also done on, on wood. Is it important that these images of trees are actually painted on pieces of wood? Well, not really, um, not really. Um, I use wood because what I don't like about painting is, is canvas, the feel of canvas. They call that give, and I, it bothers the living daylights out of me. And, <laughs> and it goes back and forth and back and forth. And so when I oh, do paint still. on on canvas, I put it on a board, and then I stretch it later on. But here, these panels are just wonderful. And, um, and I play around with them, and uh, so they, and I, I work quite small. It's often not more than about this. So, um, and I, st I also don't work directly on the wood. I, I work with spray paint. I start with spray paint and I find it often the direction that the, a piece is going to take comes out of the color that I use hmm. uh, as, as, the, as the basis. And then from there on you get the, that's, that's a, definitely a system. You get the, the, the spray paint and sometimes it's ombre, sometimes it's met more than one color. Um, and, uh, and then on top of that comes the, the tree shape or the tree shapes. And then... And the how, is the tree shape, how is the tree shape applied, not with spray paint? With a, with a brush? No, the, 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 it's, it's applied with this. The absolutely wonderful post, post cap. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, that was my brother-in-law. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> so this is the Posca pen, pen. Ah. and uh, that is a, a fr an artist friend of mine, Elizabeth Casquero. Uh, she said, have you tried the Posca pens? And I said, no, don't know anything about them. So then I ordered a few and, and, the, and I just totally fell in love. I couldn't stop working with them. So that's so what I do. It's, uh, and, and also, I like, like, I like to use gold because then you're not supposed to do that. So I do that. <laughs> Things, like, <laughs> Things like this. I, I've never stopped being rebellious. <laughs> so um, what is it you hope the viewer will take away after seeing your work? And what's the relationship you strive for? Uh, between your well, work and your I'm work. always interested in what they think because very often people see totally different things than I. Uh, sometimes I vehemently disagree with what they're seeing, and sometimes I agree, and and or I get a, another uh, viewpoint, and I find that very interesting. Uh, 
And I, yeah, I guess many artists, and at least me, I just like it when people like my work. So that's, that's this feeling of, uh, of, uh, yeah, uh, being a little bit in the limelight. That's always pleasant. Um, but yeah, what people should take away from my work, I find, is is this same sense of um, wonder that I feel when I make it. Mm -hmm. It's like, what is it? I often look at my own paintings and say to myself, what the hell is this? <laughs> but um, you, you want people to like your work, but you don't set out to make deliberately likable work. I mean, the work is... No, because I have at the beginning, apart from a few basics like the color and the tree shape, it is a journey of a thousand miles uh, consisting of, of tiny oh. little steps. And so I, I have often to take distance from the work and say to myself, what am I doing? Where am I going? Do I need to know this? No, I don't need to know this. It just goes on. And, um, and then at the end, when I say, now, now it should really be, um, be finished, then it is something. And then I often put it away. And, and, and then the appreciation of, the, of my own work uh, by myself comes when I have to give it a title. Then I have to look at it really closely. And very often I totally miss the mark with the title. I find that the most horrible part. And I was interested in hearing Adam refer to Shakespeare. I have had series where I used Shakespeare quotes uh, as titles. And uh, now I just stare at the painting and something will come up. Mm -hmm. And that's the last act of creating a painting. Giving it a title. Giving it a title, at least on my part. And then comes the other part of people weighing in and, and, and engaging the work and you in a discussion about the work. But you don't start out with a completed image in your mind. You just start painting. Oh, no, no. Yeah. No, I've never done that because I wouldn't know how to do that. I would criticize myself constantly like... So I, I just go um, step by step again. It's for, whether the, the work is small or large, it, it, it is little steps by little steps. And uh, it's very Zen. The, the grand creative uh, work is, uh, you know, when you make huge gestures, I, I wouldn't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. I could make a huge painting, but it would be, it would consist of tiny little um, images. Well, Roosevelt, thank you so much for joining us and, and uh, talking about your work with us. It's really interesting to hear how you work uh, and uh, how the images are, uh, appear after a thousand steps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for letting me be there. And thank you for the to the organizers for, for doing this. I think it's really cool. Great. Thank you so much. Next up is Phyllis Northup. Phyllis is an artist, teacher, and avid outdoors woman. She has a BA in fine arts and over 25 years of experience teaching art in school and community settings. Working primarily in watercolors, Phyllis's art is inspired by nature especially wildflowers and landscapes of national parks. She and her husband, Jim, a retired national park ranger and park superintendent, have lived and worked in some of America's most beautiful places, which has given her enormous inspiration for creating new works of art. Phyllis sometimes paints or sketches outside, but more often will paint in her studio from the photographs taken while out exploring the natural world. In addition to painting the larger vistas, she enjoys intimate landscapes, capturing the beauty in the small and magical world that is all around us and under our feet, but mostly unseen. She hopes that through her paintings and teaching, she can help others more fully see and appreciate the beauty of the natural world around them. 
Phyllis, uh, you depict roots, stones, plants. Um, how do you what? How do you pick your subjects? What? How do they grab you? And how do you decide that's what you want to paint? Um, I always have a camera in my pocket. And uh, any time I'm out hiking or biking or kayaking, and then the camera's in the dry box, but I, I always have a way to capture an image that I see while I'm out exploring. And when I'm out there, I'm always looking for what might make a good painting and what might be something that I could share my um, love and appreciation of with other people through my work. Um, but are you attracted to form or color or, or, or uh, a, a, a sort of character of a natural object? What is it that grabs you? I think the character of the natural objects and the setting and just finding, uh, especially with the intimate landscapes, those, those small things that most people just walk past and don't see. And I just love having an eye for them and discovering them. And uh, I really have a desire to want to share and say, hey, look, look at this. This is really cool. We're showing these images quite large, but they're actually very small. Some of them are mm -hmm. only six by six or six by eight inches. Isn't that right? That's some correct. Yeah. Larger, uh, 24 by 24, but some are very small, aren't they? They are. I, I uh, tend to be very, very detail oriented and I work a lot with really tiny brushes. So it takes a very long time to build up the layers of the watercolors to um, create that kind of depth of color and detail. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the sense of close observation and the small scale are are really correlated, are they? In they are, the, yeah, yeah. Because of your interest in, in precise detail, you tend to zoom in very close and, uh, uh, and, and work very small, mm -hmm. quite small. Yeah, not, not always, but a lot of times, yeah, especially with the intimate landscapes because there is so much detail on them. I, I could take, 40 hours working on a, a painting that's six by nine um, inches, that is. Mm -hmm. So this one that you're showing right now is six by nine inches and it, it, it took me probably a month or so to complete uh, it. And do you work exclusively in watercolor or do you use other media as well? Um, I do work in watercolors usually. Uh, one of the pieces in this exhibit is actually pencil and watercolor. I did the, the two pieces that were roots over rocks like that and I, I have a whole collection of photographs to work from that will be part of that series. Um, I enjoyed that just for something different. Usually it's just watercolors. I started in oils but um, switched to watercolors when my kids were born and I didn't want the toxins in the house. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah now it's it's almost exclusively watercolors. And you, Occasionally ink and watercolor too, but. And you find the watercolor more satisfying than the oils? Um, I do. Um, I loved oils. I started painting in oils when I was about seven years old. Um, but um, like I said, I switched when my kids were born and I kind of have never looked back. Um, I love that transparency and the building up of the layers um, and the freshness of watercolors and it's a really unpredictable medium and it often does something I don't expect and it's like well that didn't come out like I thought it would now what um, and so there's this constant creative problem-solving process that I like I think that's kind of fun mm -hmm. but at the same time you're able with watercolor to get an incredible uh, sense of detail and um, so you must use it quite dry. Is that how you get that level of detail? It's a combination of techniques. I, I use all the different techniques, um, but to get the, the real precise detail, it's wet on dry. Mm -hmm. Wet on. This one with the misty background, it's kind of wet when I start and the, the level of moisture is important, trying to get that kind of misty tree in the background. Mm -hmm. um, it has to be just right. If it's too wet, it'll just bleed out and disappear. If it's too dry, it'll be too sharp for that distant, foggy, misty look. So just mm -hmm. kind of varying degrees of dampness of the paper. Uh -huh. So um, 
How long have you been an artist and how did you become an artist? Um, I think I was born an artist, actually. I can remember when I was really a tiny little girl um, saying to my mom, Mommy, I want to make something today. And my mom, bless her heart, always kept a stash of wallpaper scraps and toilet paper rolls and aluminum pie plates and all kinds of scraps of this and that. And I would be very content for hours making things. Um, my grandmother was a kindergarten teacher and she recognized my creative little soul and she bought me the coolest beginner's oil painting set when I was about seven. And uh, I can remember it to this day. It's a neat little wooden box with the palette and the brushes and the little tubes and the little cups for my linseed oil and turpentine and everything that I needed to become a, uh, an oil painter. And of course, at seven years old, I had no idea what I really was supposed to do with these materials. So my folks found me someone to teach me lessons. And I took oil painting lessons every Saturday morning when I was in elementary school and every Tuesday night all through high school. Hmm. And then a degree in fine arts in college, which I'm very grateful my parents never tried to talk me out of. They appreciated the fact that it was just a core part of who I was. And it was kind of pointless to talk me out of it. So they convinced me to do something practical with a uh, minor in business, which probably was a good idea. But um, yeah, so my, my, uh, my grandma and my parents, I think, were very influential in helping me find that path. Mm -hmm. Well, as an adult, you've lived a pretty uh, peripatetic lifestyle, and um, it, you've been in some beautiful places. Um, but um, do you, has that been a challenge for you as an artist to move around so much? No, it's been fabulous. Um, I feel really, really, really fortunate that I was able to live and work in some of this nation's most beautiful places. Mm -hmm. um, it, truly really been a gift and I have such a backlog of images that I want to get to and paint, uh, I'll never finish. Um, but yeah, I feel really, really lucky that I had those opportunities. And where have you taught art then? Um, no, oh, I'm certified in six different states, I think. Um, okay. I've taught in, let's see, New Jersey, Virginia, North Carolina, Arizona, uh, Wyoming, and then community organizations in the other places. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Great. And uh, what is it you want the viewer to take away with them when they see your work? Um, I actually do have a mission with my work. Um, I really hope that when people see my work that they, um, maybe it will open their eyes to the beauty of nature that's all around them. Um, not only with those small intimate landscapes that people mostly walk past or step on and don't notice, um, and also the larger landscapes, particularly of the national park. So I really hope that my work will help people open their eyes to what's around them. And that awareness hopefully leads to appreciation and then followed hopefully by the desire to preserve and protect. So kind of awareness, appreciation, preserve and protect. That's, that's kind of what I'm after with my work. Plus I just love to share what I love with other people through my work, so. And are you feeling a greater sense of urgency about your work in recent years? Um, about I'm not sure urgency is the right word, but um, I'm sorry? About the preserve and protect part, especially. Oh, oh, that part, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, yeah, these special places and nature is threatened as it never has been before. So I did a series a um, couple of years ago, um, kind of based on climate change, one of the polar bears and the disappearing ice and then the breakup of the Greenland ice sheet and kind of tried to get that message through um, with my work in that way as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And did you feel that that effort was successful? That... Oh, one never knows. Yeah. You know, you put it out there and you hope. <laughs> yeah. One never knows. Yeah. Well, Phyllis, thank you so much. It's really great to see your work. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And really wonderful ambition that you've got to share your work and, and inspire people uh, through your work to more preservation of nature. Last up is Nancy Kaiser.
Nancy is also unfortunately unable to be with us tonight. Uh, Nancy is a native of Wisconsin who has been living and painting in Rappahannock County, Virginia for over 15 years. She's well known in the local art community and was one of the planners for their first fall art tour and has been a featured studio on the tour every year. <clears throat> Her work has appeared in shows and galleries around Northern Virginia. Nancy's work ranges from panoramic landscapes of the Blue Ridge Mountains to intimate details of, of wildflowers and gardens. Her paintings communicate a love of nature and country life with a fluid, colorful style. Nancy describes her work featured in this month's virtual art exhibitions. I've recently become inspired by a visit to Hooper's Island, which is near the Blackwater Wildlife Refuge on the eastern shore of Maryland. The island is sinking into the Chesapeake and consists of beautiful marshland and a few abandoned houses. I usually sketch the scene on location, take a photo, and proceed to do a value study in pencil. I actually paint the scene in my studio using watercolor or pastel, sometimes combining the two. The rural countryside in Rappahannock is a continuing inspiration to me. So if we can zoom in on a couple of the paintings, maybe the one straight in front of us, um, this is one of her images of Rappahannock County, uh, Jim Bill's farm. So a, a farm in, in Rappahannock County, uh, obviously rendered in the fall with uh, uh, loose washes for the trees in the background. She mentioned uh, Hooper's Island on the Eastern shore uh, a place that's very threatened by erosion. Uh, apparently it loses something like 24 acres a year uh, to coastal erosion. It's also at risk because of storms, floods, and rising sea levels. Uh, this house still standing is, refers to some of the abandoned structures on Hooper's Island um, that, uh, that um, are, are still there despite the fact that people are sort of pulling back from uh, the, the uh, more endangered parts of the island. So she's, I think, uh, conveys a kind of, uh, there's a, a kind of elegiac quality to a lot of these works that I think are expressive of the fact that <clears throat> this is a very imperiled landscape uh, and one that she's motivated to uh, record uh, uh, as, it, as it disappears. and uh, some uh, images of the, uh, the uh, way of life, the fishing boats, the, the oyster men and the, bo the oyster boats and the uh, crabbing boats uh, that still constitute the livelihood of a lot of people on the Eastern shore. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of, of this evening's uh, Meet the Artists event and our, our tour of the virtual exhibition. Um, I remind everyone who's uh, participated this evening that you can visit the exhibition again and again at your leisure. Uh, it'll be up for about a month. Um, all the work is also available for purchase directly from the artists. You can enter detail view by clicking directly on an image for a closer view of each work and detailed information uh, by clicking the eye on the right-hand side of the screen when in detail view. You can then go back to the image by clicking exit detail view in the upper right corner of the exhibition. Contact information for each artist is provided in the, in the information on each work. Uh, should you have questions or wish to inquire about any work, uh, this is available when in detail view. I want to thank the Rappahannock Association for Arts in the Community for hosting this series of virtual art exhibitions. Remember their monthly through October. Uh, thank you to all the artists who participated this evening and, uh, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you back uh, again and again in this exhibition and look forward to welcoming you to future exhibitions.
Thank you so much for being with us this evening, and thank you to all the artists. Thank you.